coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. You don't have to hear it through the grapevine. You can get it right here on the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm going to go right for it here today. We feature evergreens and also herbs. Evergreens at this time of the year, of course, are most loved. You think of O Tannenbaum, O Christmas tree. How lovely are your branches? Or I think of uh, Barbara Streisand singing the song Evergreen. Remember that song? That is not a song I know, actually. Evergreen. this time. Yeah, beautiful. Evergreen. Uh, she would sing Ageless and Ever, Ever. Oh, I know Rain. that song. Yeah, it's okay. from That's a okay. Star is Born, a 1976 movie, Barbara Streisand with Chris Christopherson. And it was a remake or adapted from a 1954 musical starring Judy Garland. Okay, we got our music <laughs> segment out of the way here today. Evergreens can be a diverse range of both broadleafed and coniferous trees and shrubs that retain their foliage over winter. A coniferous evergreen has needle-like foliage. A broadleaf evergreen has wider foliage and, in many cases, spectacular blooms. But evergreens provide that continuity in our landscape to provide structure in your landscape. We use them for tall hedges, mid-size hedges, low hedges, ground covers, upright accents, globe accents, specimen plants, foundation plants, which are the bones of a landscape, and then of course even flowering like broadleafs, rhododendrons, etc. Stacy, you'd have to say evergreens are an important part of our landscapes. There is no landscape that's complete without some evergreen, I would say, even if you live in a warm climate, because things still go dormant. And you need some evergreen there to uh, to keep the landscape looking interesting all season long. Yeah, exactly. And why do we love evergreens? Of course, this is the time of the year when evergreens take center stage. We love evergreens. I guess we get to uh, thank the 16th century Germans for cutting trees and bringing them inside the house and starting that whole Christmas tradition. As a matter of fact, I was reading the first records of Christmas trees being cut for a home display in the U.S. comes from the 1820s in Pennsylvania's German community. And then by the 1890s, Christmas ornaments were arriving from Germany and Christmas tree popularity was on the rise. So another reason that evergreens are top of mind this time of the year and probably not a good way, I was reading uh, an article from the National Library of Medicine that said Christmas tree syndrome respiratory and skin allergies to conifers occur in 7% of Oof. people. Mold and pollen, mold allergy, 13% of people. So not everybody embraces cutting an evergreen tree and dragging it inside the it, house. We got to go back to that pollen thing for a second. Though. <laughs> I, I understand that pollen is absolutely an allergen. Uh, it's intended to be that way because you know, from a plant perspective, pollen should not stick onto things, but, you know, right. it should be up in, in the air or on insects. Exactly. And conifers, such that we use for Christmas trees, are wind pollinated. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time Christmas rolls around, pollen is a ghost of Christmas past, as it were. There yes. is no pollen around. The, the tree has been well past flowering, doesn't have any flower buds on it because they've been trimmed. And any pollen that was flying around, I mean, most of them flower like in March. So yep. pollen's a done deal by that point. Yeah. So Well, you know, it's a thing. Saying. It's right there in that study, and I'm not pollen your leg. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the benefits of evergreens. They smell good all year long. Continuity through the season. So they give us interest uh, 12 months out of the year in structure. They tend to be low maintenance, energy efficiency for your home or privacy they provide hedging, bird and wildlife cover and sanctuary, a foundational backdrop for color, oxygen, boundary delineation, specimen beauty, in other words, four seasons of interest, a wind block, they muffle noise, they create a screen or a microclimate. These are hard workers. They are. And, you know, I really do want to go back to the wildlife thing because, yeah, if you were a birder 
or you want to welcome birds in your yard, it is so important to have a mix of evergreen and deciduous plants. There are lots of birds that prefer to hang out in evergreens and they provide coverage from above. So if there's hawks about, things like that. Um, And, you know, I have a whole lot of chickadees in my yard right now taking full advantage of my two pine trees as well as all the deciduous stuff that's out there. So uh, it's an important part of making your yard welcoming. Well, yeah, it's a good point, Stacey. This time of the year, the the landscape is rather bare. And so when you have evergreens to kind of hide out in, maybe protect from the wind, of course, wildlife love evergreens. We all love evergreens. I feel a limb, a rick coming on. Here we go. Oh, Tannenbaum and evergreen. My natural winter dopamine right here in my neighborhood. The reason you smell so good, you're not polypropylene. My car's pine tree freshener is scented to mask what has fermented. It hangs from my rear view mirror, allows me to breathe much clearer. One of the greatest things ever invented. I love those little <laughs> pine tree. That's a freshers. good one, Rick. Thank you. Like that. Well, you know, evergreens give you a return on investment. If you think about it with deciduous trees, every year they got to put out this energy to create all this foliage, then manufacture all summer, and then drop that foliage in winter and the process starts all over again next year. Evergreens don't necessarily photosynthesize all winter. They can, but they don't necessarily photosynthesize all winter, but they can handle harsher climates, mountainous climates, uh, because the foliage is there, ready to serve when the time is right. And that's the amazing thing about evergreens is that they're so adaptable even to harsh conditions. Yeah, and you know, I think that um, it's important that people know that evergreens aren't actually evergreen. Exactly. Uh, They do lose their leaves, so they don't keep the same foliage for their entire lives. Eventually, the foliage becomes less effective at photosynthesis. Dust, pollen, indeed, when it's around, covers the, the foliage and makes them less effective at photosynthesis. So depending on the plant, they lose their oldest leaves every year, every two years. Um, and a lot of people freak out when they see it because mm-hmm. they think that something's happening. But it's just anytime that foliage is turning yellow, it indicates that the plant is translocating the chlorophyll, saying, hey, I'm going to store this, all this good stuff up in here. I'm not just going to drop it on the ground. I'm going to take all that energy. I'm going to store it within me. And then I'm going to drop these. So that's what the yellowing or browning sure. you know, signifies. Mm-hmm. But you know, it usually happens in fall. And people get a little bit freaked out, but it's totally normal. And I always tell people when they are, you know, like, oh, is is this okay? If it's within the body of the plant and not at the tips of the branches where the new growth is coming from, you probably don't have anything to worry about. Agree. And of course, uh, it depends on the species also. If you have, for example, white pine, our state tree here in the state of Michigan, it will do that pretty much every year. I think it sheds, what, it's second year needles or third year needles, whatever. And then you look at a bristle cone pine, it may be 30, 40, 50 years. But so not all evergreens are created equally, but you're right. They will shed the needles. They're also very good and adapted to shedding snow. Mm -hmm. The branches tend to be flexible, bendy. They tend to swoop downward and uh, that helps these trees, of course, right out the winter. Well, especially the conifers. So less so with some of the broadleaf evergreens. Not so great with the snow coverage, but certainly, you know, the pines, your spruces, the firs, just looking at them, you can tell those branches are really designed to take that snow load and they look so good. They don't look tortured. You know, if you see a plant that's not supposed to take a snow load, all covered in snow, it's like, ee. Yikes. But when you see (laughs) a conifer, you're like, oh yeah, it looks right at home. No problem there. Exactly. Exactly. And then of course you have the, the large conifers, which are totally confused because they drop all their needles. But we'll save that for another show. Stacy with Proven Winners, Color Choice Shrubs. I love a lot of the evergreens that are available for people to use in their landscape. Tater Tot, Arborvitae comes to mind right away. Celtic Pride, I love that. Ooh, Siberian Cypress in my landscape. Uh, full Speed, a Hedge, Stonehenge, Taxis, and of course, on a show uh, last year, we talked about uh, Tortuga Juniper. Oh, yeah. I love my junipers. All fantastic for your landscape. So we embrace evergreens, not only at this time of the year, but of course, year round. And evergreens, my friends, are the gift that keeps giving. 
Coming up next, Plants on Trial. We'll see what Stacy has on her mind today. That's next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, I'm going to get right into it and just say that today's plant on trial is Castle Spire Blue Holly. Okay. And the reason that I'm just coming around, you know, usually I give a long preamble here because <laughs> it's not going to be a preamble. It's going to be a postamble ah, okay. um, because I, <laughs> I've got so much to say about this plant that kind of, I think it's, it, the background is so fascinating and I really want to share it as we talk about evergreens. So I might not fully get back around to telling you how amazing Castle Spire Blue Holly specifically is. We are going to be talking about holly and hardiness and broadleaf evergreen. So, you know, like you're saying in the first segment, most people, when they think of evergreens, what comes to mind, the sort of stereotypical picture in their head is going to be a pine tree, right. pine, a spruce, a fir. You know, people tend to use pine trees as sort of the catch-all for all conifers, but I... I have that all the time. People will say to me, can you come to my house? I'm having a problem with my pine tree. And it ends up being something completely different. Right. So, it's yes, like, we use that term loosely like Kleenex. Or like, you know, when you go in the South and they say, what kind of Coke do you want? Yeah. <laughs> so, something, something I want a sort of soda. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of becomes a catch-all. But like you said, these conifers, which most people think of as evergreens and are typically evergreens, like you said, larch and metasequoia, there's some exceptions in there, are either needle-leafed, so think of like a pine, or scale-leafed like a juniper or arborvitae where, We've talked about this before. They kind of almost look like under like seaweed or coral or something like that. But yeah, broadleaf evergreens is a term that, you know, when someone's not familiar with it and you say, oh, well, are you interested in broadleaf evergreens or whatever? They have to kind of stop for a minute and, and mm-hmm. say, what is that? And a broadleaf evergreen is exactly what it sounds like. An evergreen, but the leaves are wide, broad, instead of needle-like or scale-like and very narrow. So we're talking about all the adaptations that conifers and things have for cold, wintry weather. And those vastly reduced leaf surfaces, just as needles or scales, are one of them. So like, for example, a pine, uh, the needles are in little bundles. And when it's very cold, the pine responds by bringing that bundle together and reducing the leaf surface. So it's just the outside of each needle and those center, those other edges, they all come together into a little bundle. It's uh, just one of those adaptations. Strength in numbers. Strength in numbers, reduce that surface area. Mm -hmm. So broadleaf evergreens tend not to be quite as cold tolerant as your needle leaf or scale leaf evergreens. Sure. Um, just like you were saying that having that broad leaf surface means two things. It means that there is a lot more surface area for water to evaporate off of, and that catches the sun and a lot of repeated, you know, sun, cold, it, it can, wind. It, yeah, when it, it just, mm-hmm. it causes the plant a lot of stress. But that said, if you are in say USDA zone four or five, even six, We definitely have some very popular broadleaf evergreens. You know, I think I grew up in a neighborhood. I think I've said this before um, where rhododendrons were like the front front yard planting. The queen. Like everybody had a rhododendron. Why? Because the front yards tended to be near the house, tended to be Mm -hmm. shady. So a rhododendron is a perfect example of a broadleaf evergreen because it is evergreen. And indeed, its leaves are quite broad. Cherry laurel is another one. Not totally hardy for us, so we tend not to grow a lot of it. But if you sort of get more towards the southeast, skip laurel or cherry laurel is a very popular plant. Boxwood rings a bell. Everywhere. Boxwood is everywhere. And it's another great example of sort of what these, uh, you know, potential liabilities of a broadleaf evergreen are in a cold climate. Because how many people, when spring comes along, are looking at a boxwood that doesn't really look all that great? Because they can be very susceptible to to all of these challenges. Now, one of the classic, most beautiful, most desirable broadleaf evergreens is holly. And, you know, of course, that comes from, you know, last year you talked about the Oak King and the Holly King. Um, If you ever look at like any Victorian Christmas cards or Christmas decorations, Holly is a key part of that. And even if you never do that, if you sing any Christmas song or can bring to mind any Christmas song, like, I mean, half of them have to mention Holly, right? Sure. It's that, it's that popular. Girl Lives. Yes. Yeah. The Holly Jolly Girl. We could go on all day about plants and Christmas carols. That would be a fun episode, actually. Yeah, it would be. And you can sing. So you could give us a little music. 
and you. I've I heard cannot. you sing. <laughs> I have tried to sing. Um, but holly. So when the holly that is is typically mentioned in these in these songs and in, in in Christmas lore is English holly, Ilex aquifolium. Okay. A very cool plant. It, if you you know look up a picture of it, it looks like that classic sure. holly. The leaves are very spiny. The berries are very red. The foliage is dark, glossy. The thing about English holly is it's not hardy. It's about a USDA zone seven at best plant. And some of the variegated varieties of English holly are even less so. So um, not a plant that most of the U.S. could grow for many years. And there was a woman named Kathleen Meserve who lived on Long Island and really loved using holly for decorating and uh, said, you know what, I'm not content to just be told, no, I can't grow English holly or it just keeps getting winter damage. So even though she had no real experience, she was just a home gardener. She went into her backyard and started making crosses. And she took English holly, I like Zocafolium, and crossed it with a bunch of different Asian species. So transferring the pollen of one onto the other and planting those out and testing them against the winters out on Long Island. Um, and she eventually developed the plant that we now know as blue holly. And what most of us in colder parts of the U.S., when we think of an evergreen holly, it is the plant that we think of. That sure. is the holly that we grow. Sure. So blue girl, uh, blue boy, China girl, China boy. There's all of these, uh, all of these different ones. And they were all created by this woman wow. who just took it on herself in the 1950s to say, I'm not content with my options for holly. I want the best of English holly and I'm going to get it. And she did it. That's interesting. And she was for a time, Kathleen Meserve owned the most plant patents out of anybody in the entire U.S. Wow! As a, an amateur plant breeder, so it's it's a I love this story because I think it really speaks to how a determined person can make something happen, and that the the spirit of risk that we talk so much about in everything that we talk about is like, well, just give it a try. You know, the stakes mm -hmm. are relatively low. Entrepreneurial. Yeah. So um, Castle Spire was not developed by Kathleen Meserve, but it is also a Meserve holly. So if you were to look at the tag of these plants, you'll see that the species on there, instead of being Ilex aquifolium or Ilex opaca or whatever, it's going to say Ilex, an X, which is cross Meserve, because the whole genus was named for Kathleen Meserve. So okay. Castle Spire is a blue holly that came from Germany. It became so popular that it spread all over the world. And um, a lot of the, the original blue girl, uh, China girl hollies are a little bit more um, kind of uh, columnar. And Castle Spire has a very, very strong pyramidal habit. And people love that for an evergreen in their landscape. You know, we didn't talk a whole lot about the habits of evergreens, but I think that's one of the things that so appeals to people. Um, and especially at this time of year, if you're driving around and, you know, I am not the world's biggest fan of dwarf Alberta spruce by any stretch. But right now I have to confess when someone's putting Christmas lights on them, they're great. They work, they, they work perfect. It's like, that was the only reason they were invented was to make a good scaffolding for Christmas. <laughs> Careful. And to, and to attract spider mites, of course. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but they're pyramidal and we love that pyramidal shape. Yes, of, exactly. Of that. And that great, that appealing shape. So Castle Spire gets to be about eight to 10 feet tall and three to five feet wide. So it's going to have that nice uh, narrow footprint. So it's a good space saver. It's a great hedging plant. Now, you know, we talk a lot about arborvitae or juniper for hedges, and those are great choices, but not they're not what everybody wants. Some people do want that look of a broadleaf evergreen. And the hardiness of all of the blue hollies is USDA zone five to seven. So, wow. she, so Kathleen Meeser have managed to bring the hardiness down whole two full zones wow. and still have a lot of the best qualities of English holly. And that's what you're going to see in castle spire. So it is a female. You're going to need to plant the male castle wall if you want those red berries. One male for every five to seven females should be sufficient. And you can plant them anywhere within 50 feet of each other um, to make sure that there's berries on the females. Or if it's, if it's a hedge, I think you can get away with intermixing the males. But sometimes if it's a really prominent front yard planning people want to kind of tuck the mails away having worked in a garden center for years that's a question a lot of people ask stacy it's a big thing for people trying to figure out how do i get these hollies to pollinate yep so uh 
that was a lot of information. And there's a lot more I could say because I think they're really cool plants. And again, I love that story. And I think that when you have that extra reason to love them, it just makes you want to plant them even more. But these are definitely going to be best planted in spring. So they have all season to get established. So add this to your planting list for when you shop at the garden center this uh, spring. And if you would like to see pictures and get all the details about Castle Spire Blue Holly, you will find that at Gardening Simplified on air.com in the show notes. We got to take a little break because that was a whole lot of information about Holly that no one asked for, but now you know. <laughs> and when we come back, we've got the garden mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's one of my favorite times of the week where we answer your gardening questions. If you have a gardening question for us, you can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and you can leave us a link, a, a message through our contact form, as Jean did, and I believe that Jean uh, wanted to uh, maybe perhaps fund the uh, Rick fan club because oh. she has glowing praise for you. Oh, thank you very much. She says, just wanted to give a shout out to Rick. I've watched so many gardeners talk about shredding leaves for the most wonderful compost. I have the leaves for sure, but my mower doesn't have a bagger. So I tried mowing through them and raking them up. Lots of work with little to show for it. Then Rick talked about how he used his weed eater in a trash can. I thought I'd give it a try. I donned my eye goggles and went to work. I started with a few in a tub and it worked so well. I used it in a wheelbarrow already filled with leaves. What a gold mine. I covered two raised beds and the rest I spread in a flower bed. I am fully expecting bumper crops of flowers next summer. So thank you very much, Rick. She's speaking Yay, your language. <laughs> I love it, Jean. Thank you so much for that note. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the fact that safety first, you put on the eye goggles, maybe even some earplugs and you grind those things up and boy, oh boy, is that beautiful for the landscape. Way to go, Jean. Yeah, I'm really glad that that worked out. I wonder if anybody else tried it. So if you did try it, let us know. Um, I have to say, when you were describing it, I was sitting right here next to you and I was like, okay. But, uh, you know, <laughs> now you've... you've <laughs> hey, you know, uh, and, and I appreciate Gene doing this because when I would do it, my neighbors would be watching. I'd see them peeking <laughs> through the windows and I'm wearing eye goggles and I'm out there doing this and they think I've lost it. Uh, when the reality is, it's pure genius. So thank you, Gene. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, so... Uh, Great. And you know what else I love about this is that you only need one tool. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's great when you can have a, a tool that you already own and use it for a completely novel and unexpected purpose like this. So, And then once that works, Gene, you're going to want to step up to the churninator. I've got one of those, my Arnold Schwarzenegger churninator. And then you're on a whole new level. So it's like one invention begets the next. You got it. All right. What do we got in the mailbag this week, Rick? Uh, John, John from Ada would like to know if there's anything at this time of the year to support a lack of weeds in the spring in our flower beds. And then birds, exclamation. Yeah, that's my answer. Oh, <laughs> I see you put it in the notes here. Yes, for I put me. it in the notes. Because, Thank you. <laughs> and it, has, it does have two exclamation points because that's the best possible solution here mm. is birds. Um, and I find that all the time. So um, I one of the reasons that my yard is so full of birds, I put out suet and, and feed them as well. Um, but I love to leave all of that stuff in my garden and the birds just pick around and with the freezing and thawing and the ground heaving and moving through the winter, that keeps bringing up new seeds for them to eat. And sure. I think that birds are the best organic weed control that we have. You just have to have a, a scenario or a situation where they feel welcome enough to come in. So there's not any cats roaming around or, you know, other things that would make them feel unsafe. You've got plenty of coverage for them in the form of evergreens and shrubs and places where they can perch and flee if they don't feel safe. Um, but bird, I, I honestly, I often think about what my landscape would look like if I didn't have so many birds working on weed control for me. I mean, it's bad enough as it is. So without their help, I shudder to think I truly do. That's fantastic. And a great natural approach. Of course, for John, I would mention, as I've mentioned on the program before, the best time of the year for weed control is in the fall, September, October, in my opinion, because then we're dealing with annual weeds also, as opposed to the spring. But yes, Stacy, at this point of the year, 
let's let the birds do the work and eat away. And, and, you know, here in Michigan this winter, we don't have a lot of snow cover like we usually do. So, yeah, there's a lot of that natural food out there. Right. Anytime that's exposed, they're going to be out there foraging. And then, you know, I uh, typically don't use a lot of pesticides or herbicides in my yard, but I do make an exception for pre-emergent uh, in certain beds in my yard, okay. like where I'm growing cactus and stuff, and I really can't, <laughs> can't get in there to weed. I do use like a pre-emergent, and it works great. So you wouldn't put that down now because it would just you know basically go off and, and not really have any effectiveness but that will take care of whatever the birds don't eat in spring if you're open to using something like that yeah, and the reason i do the control in the fall is because the winter annuals are in a rosette stage and it's mm -hmm. not really blooming or seeding until we get to spring when how would you put it stacy blammo all of a sudden they're there blammo blammo indeed all right. Mary asks, help. This fall, I planted three little limelight hydrangeas in front of my house, which faces southwest. Their tag said full to part sun, which probably would have been fine in western Pennsylvania, where I used to live. But I'm now in middle Tennessee, and I'm starting to think that it will be too hot and sunny for them in that spot by the middle of next summer. Should I dig them up, move them someplace shadier in spring? I don't want to lose them. So it's a great question, Mary, and I'm glad you asked it. And there's a couple of issues here. So first of all, yeah, our plant tags, as well as, as other plant tags that you're going to read, are going to have typically that range of sun tolerance. And, you know, the way that plants are produced and distributed in North America um, means that, you know, typically you're not going to get a tag that's just for the South and a separate tag that's for the North. These plant tags, they need to serve the needs of an entire country with vastly different climate conditions. And so, you know, a lot of times we really do rely on the expertise of local garden centers and local gardeners to say, sure, that would have been fine in, in Western Pennsylvania, as Mary says, but in a warmer climate, you're going to go more for that, that semi shade or, or part sun kind of condition. So, um, it, it is a, a big story to tell in a little space, and that does make it challenging. But that said, um, I would say that panicle hydrangeas are unequivocally the most sun and heat tolerant of all hydrangeas. Agree. So you're already off to a good start by having you know those particular types of hydrangeas in that. And then second of all, even in the south, like unless you're in a very very hot climate, like say USDA zone nine or warmer, most of the time. If you can provide those plants enough water uh, by through irrigation, they can take more sun. The the sun and the irrigation really go hand in hand and, and how much heat the plant can take. So yes, there's certainly exceptions. And I've heard from plenty of gardeners in Texas who there's just no way they're going to be able to grow something in the sun because it's much hotter and mm -hmm. the sun is more intense than here. But, you know, especially in a place like Middle Tennessee, um, if you are able to provide the irrigation, if they're on drip, if you have a regular irrigation system, I wouldn't try it just through hand watering because that will become a nightmare and you will soon start to resent them. Um, but I would actually say if you have irrigation, I think they're going to be just fine with mulch, you know, a good two to three inch layer of mulch. Um, and I would not move them. But if you don't have irrigation and you're concerned about it, it certainly wouldn't hurt to move them. Spring is a great time. And the, the sooner you move something after it's planted, the less you know stressful that is on you and the plant. So, Stacy, you do a wonderful job writing descriptions for plants and copywriting. And people, of course, love using that information uh, like they do with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. But I have to tell you, when you're in the garden center and you look at a tag and it says, Part Sun. Moist, well-drained soil. Not quite sure how to do that. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> but, you know, I often tell people we garden in the real world, not exactly. the ideal world, but we do kind of have to give those ideal conditions. But, you know, that's one of the reasons we do the show is to help people better exactly. understand those conditions. Um, and you can always ask at your garden center, and hopefully you'll, you'll find someone who knows and, and wants to help you. But um, the information is out there, and that's where the experience part of gardening comes in as well. Karen is wondering, I live in zone five. What's the best thing to do when my shrubs and trees are weighed down after a heavy snowfall? Should I try to shake off the snow or just wait for it to eventually melt? The, uh, the Taylor Swift thing, shake it off or whatever <laughs> her song was. And uh, by the way, for folks who are watching us or listening uh, all over the world here in zone five, Michigan, uh, Halloween. Oh, gosh, yeah. 
the end of October, we got wet, heavy snow. I got 12 inches. Yeah, we got 10 inches. And boy, and the plants still had their foliage on them. So they were bending. Yeah, they were, they were both in bed. So that's the, the, the kicker of it all is that if the snow is very wet, it's very hard to remove. If it's fluffy, I would say get a broom, try to take it off the best that you can. If it's a conifer, don't worry about it. They're made to to take that snow load. You don't have to spend your time doing that. Make sure you stand back because if you ever tried to dust the snow off of something and gotten a head full of it yourself, not very fun. Um, And I would also say to prioritize, and I've seen this uh, in my, in my old house, prioritize plants that are likely to get dripped on by ice because what's going to happen if you have all the snow on there and then it's like near your home and there's going to be dripping water and you're going to get ice forming in there that snow is going to contribute and add a ton of weight once that starts icing up so it really does just depend i would say use a broom try not to do it with your hands because that's more likely to cause breakage and sometimes it's just going to happen and that's just the way it is. Sometimes you just got to step away and let nature take its course. You really do because you can do more damage uh, yeah, for sure. messing with it. Yeah, and sometimes if it's icy and things are, are sticking to the plant. Um, so get out your broom, do the best you can, prioritize your most valuable plants and uh, hope for the best because that's all we do in winter really anyway. So thank you all for your questions. If you do have a question, don't forget gardening simplified on air.com. You can find out how to reach us there. We're going to take a little break when we come back. We've got a guest for branching news, so you're not going to want to miss that. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for Branching News. And today we talk to Deborah Kanapke. Now, she is the garden sage. Horticulture and teaching actually is her third career. She has a master's in horticulture, a master's in speech language pathology, bachelor's in speech and hearing science with a minor in vocal music performance from the Ohio State University. Wow. And then on top of that, I know because I've looked at her books and read some of them, writer of six books, including Herb Gardening for the Midwest. On top of all that, she's a friend of ours. And I know that if you need someone to make some fresh bread and some herb (laughs) butter, Deborah can do that too. Deborah, thanks uh, so much for joining us on the Gardening Simplified show. My pleasure to be here. And that was a wow of an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a wow of a career, oh, too. My. So, my goodness. It's amazing. And I want people, of course, to uh, to look for you, Deborah, because uh, you are a wealth of information. Your website, Deborah, can you share that with folks right off the top? Sure. And just a side note, my website is being updated by my new webmistress and so more is coming but mm. my website is www.debrathegardenstage.com and i wanted a shorter name but the garden stage was already taken by someone else and so we put my first name there and that's how it became deborah the and, garden stage and you're deborah d-e-b-r-a right Correct. Okay. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> Speaking as someone whose name has multiple spellings, I feel you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's the holiday season, and of course, Deborah's a uh, herb expert. Uh, but today we talk about tea, and of course, that aligns with herbs. Deborah, um, you say tea, I say to same. Is that correct? Well, you know, and it, it's kind of fun to play with those words. If we talk about straight tea, it's Camellia sinensis. It's that plant that we get green tea, oolongs, black tea, puar, a whole host of teas from Assam, from Assam to China, Kimuns, and more. But when we talk about herbal teas, technically the correct term to use is tisane or tisan. It depends on how you wish to say it. I mean, potato, potato. But T I S A N E. So honestly, when I talk about my herbal teas, I usually don't say herbal to sane, I say herbal tea. But um, there would be some people who would correct you on that. Not me, but. <laughs> Interesting. So to sane, to san, let's call the whole thing off. It's that typical thing. Something like that. But Deborah, you so you're saying that uh, camellia, which many people would grow for the gorgeous flowers, uh, you're saying mm-hmm. this is the base. This is the true tea plant. The true tea plant that you know, if you believe in the story, 
back around, oh, 2600 BC, there was a Chinese emperor, um, Shen Nung, who was sitting under a tree and some leaves from the tree fell into water and he drank the water and felt so refreshed that he said this was to be his beverage. And the leaves were from Camellia sinensis, the Camellia that is from China, it, it's home base. And there's actually two variants of Camellia sinensis, one that's the Southern Chinese variant with small leaves and the Northern Indian variant, which has large leaves, mm. or India. So, um, you know, that is key as there is the history of using Camellia sinensis for not only pleasure, but for health. And then there are herbs, which there are many, that we have used also for pleasure and also for health. So I know a lot of people uh, who are listening, I mean, we're, we're based in Michigan, but we do have listeners all over the country, and they're probably thinking, mm -hmm. well, hey, I have camellias, can I grow tea? But the tea plant camellia sinensis is not as hardy as a lot of the ornamental camellias, correct? That is my understanding. Um, I accidentally did leave one outside, but we are zoned at that time, zone 6A, and it died. Yeah, <laughs> they are quite tender, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is more of a zone seven or okay. zone eight plant. So if you're thinking of zone seven, Raleigh, North Carolina, zone or, or you know, Long Island and zone eight would be more of Atlanta, mm -hmm. Georgia, as a sort of a place to think about that. But a great history uh, as it relates to teas, as you mentioned, China, Japan, mm -hmm. India, mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, England. Uh, and I was reading some of your notes, Deborah, and you said uh, it was interesting to me. Uh, sweet tea and the use of milk in the Western oh. world or in England. Mm -hmm. And that caught my eye because my parents are both from Europe and I never could figure out why they put milk and sugar in their tea and ruin it. But, uh, you know, it's just a thing, right? It, it is a thing, and, and it depends, because I only use, well, and I use oat milk, but I use milk in my black or red teas and in my puar, but there will be no milk in my green or oolong teas. Sure. And I don't, I don't put milk in my herbal teas either, and often I don't use sweetener in herbal teas unless I have some bitter elements. Um, but if I do use sweeteners, I usually stick to honey or agave syrup. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah. tea makes it to America. And, um, mm -hmm. of course, we're famous for the Boston Tea Party. And my good friend <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, who always said, tea and coffee are the drink of the civilized world. So a lot of history, uh, a lot of history there. Being someone who uh, is an expert on herbs and loves herbs, uh, it seems to me, Deborah, that tea is just a, a, a natural launching point for you. Absolutely. I was drinking herbal teas before, way before I went back to school for my horticultural uh, degree. It, it's always, it's calming. I can't tell you how many times I'll come home from a meeting at night and what the only thing I want is chamomile tea with a hint of mint, usually spearmint. Mm. And I find that very restful and it gets me set up for going to bed. But then there are other teas that kind of wake you up, like peppermint. I don't have peppermint at night because that will keep me awake almost as well as caffeine does. So it depends on what you want. Um, there are so many herbs out there. I have many blends from friends and also um, local tea blenders or tisane blenders here in central Ohio. And just some wonderful things. And imagine drinking a tea from pine needles and from a spruce bud tip. And there are a lot of teas that you can make from our native plants, like bee balm or Oswego tea, which was one of the teas that replaced the tea that ended up in the Boston Harbor. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's right. As a matter of fact, I remember reading somewhere that Monarda or Bee Balm was used mm-hmm. as a substitute after that big Boston Tea Party, right? Yep, it was because it's growing wild here right. and it makes a pleasant minty tea that again is calming. Deborah, I'm seeing on the shelf a lot of uh, echinacea teas. Mm. Is this a, a fad, a trend, or is this something that uh, uh, has legs? Echinacea has been used for a very long time, and there were there are a lot of studies uh, done in Germany on echinacea and its efficacy. And it doesn't, you know, like everything that's out there in medicines or herbs or whatever, it doesn't work the same for everyone. But a lot of people will find an Im- immune system boost if they drink echinacea tea. When I'm feeling what I call punky, <laughs> Not, you know, I, I feel like my you know, chest is tight or my throat is sore. The first thing I go to is for a cup of echinacea tea. And it usually, again, has a mint in it and it may have elderberry, which is another fantastic immune system booster. And I will drink one to two cups of that. Now, by the way, my cups are not that little six ounce cup that people talk about on labels. Mine, I have a 16 ounce cup. So when I have a cup of tea, I have a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's great. We're talking to uh, Deborah Kanapke and uh, you can find her, uh, her website, Deborah, the garden sage, dot com uh herb expert and today we're talking about teas and why not tea and tranquility during a hectic uh holiday season deborah Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite things and i was on cape cod this past summer looking at the rosa rugosa but uh rose hips rose hips is there a use for that in uh, in our teas i drink a lot of rose hips in the winter uh, rose hips have very high vitamin C content, so that is something that helps, again, your system uh, to fight off maybe the cold that you're picking up from your daughter, niece, nephew, son-in-law, <laughs> you name it. Uh, so I will often add rose hips and hibiscus flowers, and that gives you a beautiful red-colored tea. And I may put in some mint and... Oh, I don't know. It depends on what I've saved during the year. I have another favorite, which is lemon verbena, which is mm. kind of a wake-up tea for me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And it makes a phenomenal cold tea in the summer. How about, and, lemon, how about lemongrass along that line, too? Yep. In fact, I'll do a lemongrass, lemon balm, lemon verbena mix, <laughs> and then add in a bit of mint, and then calm it down a little bit with either... Um, Oh, some lavender buds or let's see, I'm trying to think. A lot of times I just go out in the garden with my snip and look at what's looking good and then shove that into a bottle or one of my big jars of water and then put that in the refrigerator and 12 to 24 hours later I have tea, cold brew tea. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm, you're, you're talking about harvesting during the season, during the growing season when everything is fresh. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you're also collecting and drying. So in terms of people who want to, you know, make their own teas from the garden or stockpile during the height of the season, what is what should they know about the difference between making tea from fresh herbs versus dried herbs? That's an excellent question. If you are... If you are making uh, tea from fresh herbs, you're going to use more of them. Just because uh, the flavors, you know, in in the green tea, or or, I'm sorry, in the green, uh, what you collect from your garden, aren't as concentrated. Once you dry something, you've really concentrated those essential oils. And unfortunately, in some herbs, there are some essential oils that kind of volatile volatize off of the herb uh, once it dries. So sometimes you don't get all the notes, if you know what I mean. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, all the, mm-hmm. the flavors. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so dried tea, fresh tea, in the summer I crave fresh tea. In the winter when I can't get it, I have my dried herbs. And it's all kinds, you know, thyme, sage, 
lavender buds. By the way, lavender buds, not lavender leaves. Um, there are some compounds in the lavender leaves that can cause stomach upset and reactions in sensitive people. The buds are much a much safer part of the plant. And that's true of some of our other herbs, too, that some parts are much better than others. Whereas something like echinacea, you can use the petals, the, the leaves, and the roots, but not, not so for, for all herbs. So back to that question, for, um, so you'll be using less of the dried herbs when you make your tea than you would like a cold brew tea, although I don't usually do that in the winter. It's usually, usually hot. But my herbs, I'll use maybe one teaspoon to one tablespoon of dried herbs in a cup of tea. Whereas I would have, I have this big two gallon jar where I would have a whole fistful of herbs in the summer that go into that jar with cold water. Mm. So a big difference in volume. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, Deborah. So uh, you sent along some pictures, which uh, mm -hmm. uh, for folks listening on radio or our podcast, uh, you may want to spin over to our YouTube video. Adriana will put those pictures there. Um, I'm interested in the time lawn and uh, also in the tea box. So let's make a few quick okay. comments there. First of all, about the time lawn. Tell me about that. So... Uh, I was the curator of the herb garden at Innisfood, the Central Ohio Herb Garden from um, the unit of the Herb Society of America. We have an herb garden at Innisfood Metro Park, and I was the curator for several years. And they had a time lawn, and I thought, shoot, I want to get rid of grass. So <laughs> I, I bought about 25 different uh, types of thyme. And I planted them all, and now my time lawn has matured because that was in the 90s. Oh, wow. That was around 94, 95. Wow. And so, yeah, so that picture that you see now is probably about 10 different varieties of thyme because some are much more vigorous than others. So I will go out. They all have different flavor profiles, and some of them don't have any flavor at all. They're great as a ground cover, but not as a tea. Yeah. Uh, all yeah, all time is edible, but not all time is tasty. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So in that lawn, there are about three, three, three or four that I harvest for tea. And then I have more in my backyard in another sunny spot. Some of the more vigorous <laughs> types that would take over the world that <laughs> I will cut and dry. So that's the time lawn. And in my front yard, there's not very much grass and not very much in the backyard either. You could say, Deborah, you have time on your hands. And I'm sure you've heard that one many <laughs> times. Before. I do. <laughs> and a friend even went down and rubbed it and said, oh, I have time on my yeah, hands. Exactly. <laughs> thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> exactly. How about the tea box? So the tea box, I started giving tea talks probably about 15 years ago because I wanted people to, to understand one, the difference between the tea plant and then herbal teas or to same. And I also wanted to show the amazing variety of tea. It's like wine. There's terror. So you can have the same tea plant in different parts of China and you get different flavors of tea. Same as in India, the Darjeeling and the Assam and the Ceylons, uh, you know, they're just amazing. And it's the same plant, just like it's the same wine from grapes, mm -hmm. you know, or same, same grapes for different wines. So I put together this tea box so people could see what they look like and some of the beautiful teas that result, and I'm opening it up right now, some of the beautiful teas that result when people are... Uh, binding them in that beautiful peony flower that's in the picture, and you'll see some that look like uh, snails. Uh, actually, that's the green uh, china gunpowder, and it, it's rolled in someone's fingers. So someone does this all day long and rolls all of it so it looks like gunshot. Wow. So it's called gunpowder green, 
And there's there's also the little tool, cha, which means bird nest that's sitting there. That is a, a puar, which actually is a fermented tea uh, from Camellia sinensis. And it looks like a little bird's nest. And it's a very wonderful tea that is delightful to drink and also very healthy for you. So I put this together so people could see the differences. So I, I've had puar before and I've had some that were mm-hmm. excellent. Some that were uh, an acquired taste. I, I think that's one of the more polarizing teas. Would you was that been your experience? Mm-hmm. I have a friend who bought some because I was so enthusiastic about it, and he said, "This smells and tastes like a barnyard." <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my. and I then became the recipient of his suar tea. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely. I I can see the the appeal, but. There are some that are much stronger uh, and, and not maybe what people expect uh, when, when they're sitting down to a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, it, um, there, and there are puars that here in America we probably will never see right. that are 100 years old and way out of most of ours pocketbook range. Mm. Deborah, when we, uh, when we brew these wonderful teas, herbal teas, is water temperature a factor? Does water temperature matter? It does. Um, and if we're talking specifically about herbal teas, for the most part, you either want the water to be boiling or just under the boil, mm. which means you either listen to your teapot or look at the water inside, or I have a um, an electric teapot that brings to the temperature I want. So I can get it at 212 boiling, or I can have it at 200, which is what I call under the boil. If you have a delicate tea, like like say you're just doing straight jasmine tea, not with the green tea in it, but just jasmine, you really don't want it to get above 190 degrees, because otherwise all that jasmine is just going to float right off of that water, and you'll never, you won't taste most of it. You won't get the that really beautiful high note that you get with jasmine. So it does matter with the different types of herb teas. Now, if you are drinking a tea that has a lot of either branches or root, like in echinacea, then you need the water to boil. Otherwise, you won't extract the phytochemicals that you're hoping to drink. So do you have to know this all specifically? No, no. Just if you have any doubt, just do it under the boil or get it to boil, let it sit for a minute and then pour it over your herbs. And for the most part, you will get everything you need out of it that you um, or everything you need or want out of it. So it's an art and a science, just like gardening. Yeah, it is. And in fact, when you think about it, he is so horticultural, uh, whether it is. Camellia sinensis or herb tea, you know, it's the growing of the teas, which I like it all. I love growing it, harvesting, drying, understanding where where the different teas come from, and also what they can do for our health. And, of course, the other part of that, too, is knowing which herbs not to use in teas or which herbs can cause a problem. There are many herbs that are you know, contraindicated for someone who is pregnant or or um, breastfeeding. And so you have to be aware that you should not be drinking those teas during that time. Very, very interesting. Uh, Deborah Kanapke, she is the Garden Sage. Her website, DebraTheGardenSage.com. Deborah would love to have you on the, uh, the show again. And before I let you go, we're going to ask a very unfair question. We always ask people that we interview, and that is, I'm going to ask you for our listeners and our viewers to share with us, in your knowledge, give me your favorite herb, Number one, if it had to be at the top of the list, and your favorite landscape plant. Go ahead. My favorite herb is lavender. Mm. Uh, It was also my master's research project, Mm. and uh, it's just an amazing, amazing herb. But I like all the mints, so I'm just going to add that. And for my favorite landscape plant, 
Oh, gee, that's hard. Um, <laughs> it's unfair. I know that. I know. You know, I mean, if you ask me for my favorite tree and my favorite shrub and my favorite perennial, um, if if I uh, pushed for my favorite, favorite plant, I'm going to have to say um, orchids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that's a huge group, you know, 26,000 species. <laughs> um, and I, I just, I have fell in love with orchids and can't get enough of them. So that's actually a whole group. But if I have to say one single plant that gives me deep joy, and that would be sunflowers. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. Her name is uh, Deborah Kanapke. She's the garden <laughs> sage. Deborah, you... Uh, what you do for the gardening industry is fantastic and want to thank you and the education that you provide. Of course, folks, she has books also, which you can find at her website, including Herb Gardening for the Midwest. Deborah, uh, thanks so much for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Show and would love to have you back again to talk about some other subjects. I'd love to come back. Thank you. Thanks, thank Deborah. You, Deborah. Well, that was great. My only uh, thing here is that I didn't harvest any of my herbs over the summer, so I can't enjoy any homegrown herbal teas this winter. But no, uh, I'm putting it on the calendar for next summer, that's for sure. I'm inspired. Well, thanks to Deborah, thanks to Rick, thanks to Adriana, and of course, thank you so much to all of you. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Thanks. Thanks.